Good morning, saints and sinners. Welcome to Eureka Springs United Methodist Church. Our bulletin and online giving platform can be found at lovespokenhere.org. I encourage you to take a look at that. It has our music and everything for today's service. As we begin today, I invite you, if you will, to share our service with your friends network. To invite them to like our page and get the message out as we are still in a pandemic lockdown and we want to reach as many people as we can with our message. Today, I want to take a few moments and let's ask for prayer and keep the people of the Gulf Coast and the people of Afghanistan in our hearts as they face an oncoming disaster, both of the Taliban, but on the Gulf Coast of the hurricane that's about to hit today. So let's remember them in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that this brings you much love and much grace into your lives. Amen. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, As we came, as we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. May we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for your church where we can attend and feel so close to you, where all our senses are refreshed by your love and compassion. Every day you give us a new day, a second chance, or maybe the 150th chance to be better Christians to live up to our role to honor you and to love all peoples as we love ourselves. Today's message is focused on caring about our enemies and treating them just like we want to be treated. God, this is hard to do. We try. Sometimes there is a glimmer of hope. Other times we are hurt in return. Show us the way. Help us to have steadfast patience and help us build the strength necessary to do your will. Our minds are crowded with so many worldwide wants and needs, and yet we are lost as to how to make it all better. Political uprisings, hunger, storms, people wandering like the ancient nomads looking for a place to call home. Mysterious illnesses causing pain and death for thousands. All these pleas and prayers we lay at the foot of the cross on which your Son gave his life to save ours. We come together to offer the prayer to you that Jesus Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. We're glad you're joining us today, wherever you are. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let us rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord Rise among us, let the praises of the King rise. 
peace among us, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. God, there is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. Jesus, 
than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sense Have Jesus than anything this world affords today. The scripture reading today that is according to the Message Bible comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 22 through 36. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out, every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and that that person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Skip like a lamb, if you like. For even though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My preachers and witnesses have always been treated like this. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met and you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, Respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get in return, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers do that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind. You be kind. Thanks be to God for the gift of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. Jesus. 
river My home is over Jordan Deep river Lord I want to cross over into campground Deep river My home is over Jordan I want to cross over into campground. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast, that promised land? My home is over Jordan, deep river, Lord, I want to cross over and to camp Cross over into camp. Oh, don't you want to go to the gospel feast that promised land? I want to cross over into campground. Thank you, Bren. This week brings to an end a 20-year-long struggle with global war on terrorism against extremist Islamists. And this war ends not on a good note, but on a catastrophe. And for us veterans who have given so much of our lives in this struggle, I would ask that all of you give us some grace and understanding as we try to wrap our minds around what has taken place. The question of whether or not our sacrifices were worth anything and the years that we spent dedicating our lives to service of our country, did all of that just go up in smoke overnight? Many of us are struggling with that and they certainly need your grace and understanding and not your armchair expertise on terrorism or Middle East policy. 
Since this is ending the war on terrorism that started on 9-11 almost 20 years ago, I want to reflect on that for a moment. How did that day change this country? I imagine all of us remember exactly where we were at the moments the planes flew into the towers. That's vividly seared in my memory. And at first, I really appreciated how the country, we all came together and we were no longer Republicans or Democrats or Christians or Jews or Hindus. We were just Americans. And we rallied around one another. Hundreds and thousands of us went to New York to help. We gave blood. We gave of our time. We helped out. And then very quickly, it seemed that politics got back involved and the country changed again. And I don't know if the country changed for the better. We entered into a very long struggle. First with a war in Afghanistan, and then a war in Iraq, and then little wars sprouting up all over the world. I bet many of you don't realize that we have military in over 150 countries around the world fighting terrorism. We've been doing this for 20 years. And that, can't, that cannot but leave scars. And I want to ask and ponder that question. How has that changed us as a nation? When I was in college, I majored both in history and philosophy. And there's a philosophical quote by the philosopher Nietzsche that just continues to haunt me. He asked the question, or he made the statement, those who fight the dragon long enough will eventually become the dragon. Ponder that for a second. What he's really saying is that when we struggle against something for too long, we will end up looking like that something. And this war on terror, I've noticed in 20 years how it's made us a fearful nation. A nation full of bitterness and anger and yes, even hate. We see enemies all around us because we've struggled so long against Islam and its extremism. We're adopting many of its worst qualities. A week ago in Springfield, Missouri, a Christian man walked into CVs and Walgreens and then finally the Walmart pharmacy before he was arrested. He came in the name of God and he told the pharmacist, you will either quit giving the vaccine or I will come back and execute every one of you. How did we end up here? where school boards are across our nation and our teachers are being threatened if they ask kids to wear masks. When people are protesting against vaccines and crying out, we will find you, we will find you, and we will kill you. How did our country end up in such a spot? Where this hatred and, and venom spouts from our lips against fellow Americans... How come we declare each other's party as a virus? The other day I saw a picture, and I've seen this before when it concerns the other party as well, but it, this particular sign said, Democrats are a virus that should be exterminated. I've also seen that sign saying Republicans are a virus as well. I recently lost a 30-year friendship with someone who told me that anybody who voted against her presidential candidate, obviously worships Satan. And I told her, I voted against your candidate. Does that make me a bad person? How did we get here? So bitterly divided, so angry, so hateful towards one another. What's happened to our country? Politics used to be this gentle ribbing of one another. Think back of Ronald Reagan, how he always teased the Democrats with those wonderful little zingers. How did that turn into the other party as my enemy? And I must destroy them or they will destroy me. 
Earlier this year, we had an insurrection. The first time in our nation's history that we did not have a peaceful transfer of power. Now, whether or not you blame what party or the other, what is not contestable is the fact that people gathered in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to commit untold acts of violence against people they disagreed with. They thought their country was so threatened that people should be murdered in order to defend it. How did we get here? And I'm not singling out a political party because both parties engage in this. If you watch the news, you're getting fed a steady diet of hatred and anger and bitterness. I mean, I can watch the news for a few minutes and suddenly I find myself just full of anger. And I have to turn it off and go, whoa, what just happened there? But how did we get here? Have we fought terrorism and extremism so long that we are becoming the very extremists that we went to war against? That's a, that's a difficult question to ponder. Especially as I see pictures of Christians holding Bibles and carrying guns, standing behind American flags or standing in front of American flags And that picture is no different than the pictures of Islamic extremists holding the Koran and the Bible, or their Koran, and standing in front of a flag of extremism. How do we look at parades of supporters waving guns, chanting for their presidential candidate, when we see the same thing happening in the Middle East? How did our country get How did patriotism become less about service to others and more about hating those who disagree with us? And that's the only way I can describe politics today is we have two parties that hate each other. And these two parties want everybody else to join in on the hate. And they use the words and expressions of hyperbole. They want us angry and bitter. And they want us hating one another. How did we get here? Did we become the very dragon that we've been fighting against? In the early stages of our country's history, before we became a nation, we got obsessed with uh, Satanism, with demonic powers. We hated the devil so much that, well... We started seeing the devil in people that we used to call our neighbors. In Salem, Massachusetts, we rounded people up and we burned them at the stake because we thought they practiced witchcraft. And by burning them at the stake, we became far worse than the enemy that we thought we were fighting. During the Crusades of the Middle Ages, when the church called us to go fight Islam, about 500 to 1,000 years ago. We hated them so much, we became something worse than they ever attained to be. It was said that when we captured the city of Jerusalem, the Christians slaughtered so many Muslims and Jews and fellow Christians that the blood flowed through the streets to the level of the horse's bridle. That was the level of the hate that we brought to that land. And for hundreds of years, we plunged the Middle East into a bloody war of conquest and reconquest. And we justified every single act of atrocity in the name of Jesus. Because we became the very thing that we hated. Because we had fought them for so long. Has this war of terror changed us? Boy, when I travel outside of the country, I see a marked contrast between different nations and America. A few years ago, I went to Canada and we crossed the border at Niagara Falls and the Canadians were very hospitable, very welcoming as they took our passports and asked us questions. But when I came back across in New England, I was met with an armed guard with an M16. He barked orders at us. He threatened us. 
Because as many people around the world say, America has become fortress America. Scared of every enemy around the corner. And you look at our news media, you look at our politics, and you can't help but agree. We've become a very hateful, a very angry, a very bitter populace. A lot of this is coming out of our churches. More and more I hear preachers dividing up the country as us versus them. Traditional values versus progressive values. Neighbors are now mortal enemies. Just because I vote differently from you, how does that make me your enemy? What happened to sitting down and discussing things instead of sitting down and getting angry at one another? Families are being split. Friendships are being ended. And our country's chasm keeps growing. And I don't know where that's going to lead us into the future. Because if we still, if we keep looking at each other as mortal enemies, we can't stay united. And the alternative is violence and bloodshed that I see preached more and more on the internet, on YouTube, in our churches. We have to fight for our values. We have to defeat our enemies. We have to defend God. We've been so angry for so long. We've become the very thing that we went to war to fight against. Jesus has some challenging words for us today as Christians. He says if we are to follow Him, we are to have no enemies. Now, that really strikes me right here. Because it asks the question of me, Do I have an enemies list? Do I have a list of people I don't like or I hate or I'm angry with? Because if I do, Jesus says, you got this all wrong. Turn that enemies list into your prayer list. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Do good to those who would do evil to you. Turn the other cheek. Give of your cloak. Go the extra mile. He says, this is what you're to do if you're to follow me. There is to be no anger and bitterness in your heart. There is to be no hatred to a fellow human being. There is only to be love and grace and mercy. There is no room for anything else. My time in the military taught me a lot of things. And one of the most important things it taught me was that lesson of love. Because despite what you've heard, most of our military seeks to do good. It seeks to love our enemies. It seeks to make the world a better place. Americans don't join the military to go off to conquer new lands and to dominate people. We join the military because we want to make a difference. We want to make the world a better place. We want to protect the innocent, children and widows and orphans. We want to do whatever we can to bring goodness to the world. And it's shocking to us when our fellow military members commit atrocities. Abu Ghraib in Iraq was a terrible blow to our military because it was not the ethics that we lived and practiced every day. To see Iraqi prisoners tortured and abused. It was horrifying to us. But a few soldiers had so much hate in their heart that they were willing to commit such atrocities. We don't want to be like that. And the church doesn't need to be like that. The church in America is failing its responsibilities. We're preaching a message of hate. We're preaching a message of threat and bitterness and anger. We tell our flock that the world is against us. That they're coming to take away our traditional values. They're going to take away the Ten Commandments or the Lord's Prayer or the Nativity scene on the square. 
Every day, the message out of the church is to beware of those people because they're out to get you. And Jesus says, that's not what I taught you. I taught you to go into this world and to love one another. Not just your fellow Christians, but everyone. What would the world look like if the Christian church actually loved everyone unconditionally. If we decided right now today that we would no more, we would no longer have any more enemies, we would simply love everyone equally, whoever we met, what would the world look like? Well, in America with a church on every block, I think that would be utterly transformational. I think it would it would end the anger and the hatred And bring this country together again. If we actually loved the way Jesus loved. Instead, we're taught to hate sinners. We're told to not associate with those people because they sin differently from we do. They're our enemy. They're a threat. But that's not what Jesus taught. That's not what Jesus did. He ate with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and all the other riffraff the world had rejected. Jesus battled His religious leaders who only wanted to preach hate and anger. And He said, no, God's kingdom is the kingdom of love. And when we can see in the eyes of everyone God's child, we're going to be much better off. You see, Jesus' message, forgiveness, grace, love, mercy, those were the antidote to the poison of the world's anger and bitterness and its hate. Jesus said the more you practice forgiveness, the more you're able to love, the more you're able to show grace and mercy, the less room you have for hate and anger. And so when we read Jesus' words today, here's the challenge that we all face. Our country is, is, is in a bad spot. We have fought an enemy for so long that we have become like that enemy. There's too many religious extremists in our nation preaching hate, preaching violence. There's too many of us listening to that message of fear and we're becoming angry and hateful, and leaning towards violence. I challenge you today to guard your words and your thoughts closely. And when you get so worked up that you say, I hate that person, take a step back and ask for forgiveness. Because you have just stepped over a red line that Jesus said never to cross. Because once we give in to hate, we're also given in to violence and bloodshed. Guard your words. Guard your thoughts. Christ never taught us to hate anyone. Christ never taught us to be bitter towards anyone. He taught us to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to bless those who persecute us, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give of our cloak, but to never, ever respond with vengeance or hatred. If we as Christians can start living that message, and if we can start preaching against and witnessing against the hate and the anger that is being stirred up in our culture, we can heal our nation. And we can make this world a better place. We fought wars for too long. And we've adopted too many of our enemies' characteristics. Lifting up gun against a fellow American. Saying you wish them dead or you wish them harm. That's not the Christian way. Something's happened to us. And we need healing if we are to change. Read the message of Jesus again. As Christians, the kingdom of God has no enemies. Just people we're called to love. And I know that's challenging. 
But that's who we are and what we're called to be. May we pray. God, forgive us as we have the ability to forgive those who have sinned against us. God, we go through this world holding on to our enemies list. We have the people in our heart that we dislike, that we hate, and sometimes we even wish harm towards. But God, remind us that this is not your way. This is not the cross we're called to carry. You summon us to love one another just as you have loved us. And while we were yet sinners, you still reached out your arms of compassion to embrace us and to return us to the fold. God, our nation is so bitterly divided. There is too much hate in our words and our conversations. Family has been pitted against family, neighbor against neighbor, countrymen against countrymen. And this divide between liberals and conservatives, between Republicans and Democrats, this cannot stand. We must heal. We must see each other as Americans again. So God, help us to claim our identity as your followers. Help us to love one another just as you have loved us. And no matter where we are, no matter who we meet, whether it be a fellow Christian or a Muslim, Jew, Hindu, or none, whether it be a Republican or a Democrat, black or white, gay or straight, help us to look past these artificial labels and to simply see a person you beautifully and wonderfully made, a person in your image, worthy of our love. Forgive us for our hatreds, for our angers, and for our bitterness. For this is not the way of your kingdom. Amen. Let us come to the place where our faith begins. Let us touch the water and be washed free of our anger and our hatred so that we may serve Christ in the fullness of His love. Remember your baptism by dipping your hands in the water. Remembering those promises to love one another just as we love God. Remember your baptism by making that ancient sign of the cross. In a few moments, we will celebrate the sacrament. And as we gather around this table, may we remember the message of its love. For it is here at this table that Christ gathered around Him those simple fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. The people the world hated and rejected. And yet He said to them, I call you my friends. And through you and through your love, I will build my kingdom. As they came that evening, Jesus would take a loaf of the bread he would give thanks to His Father in heaven. And breaking the bread, He would give it to each of them with these words. Take and eat. This is My body that I break for you. Do this in remembrance of Me so that you will know how to live as well. As His followers ate that night, they pondered His words, His teachings, about loving everyone. And as they finished their meal, Jesus would rise and He would pour a cup of the wine. And He would bless it. And He would give it to each of them with these words. Drink from this cup, all of you. For this is the cup of life that I pour out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of your sins. Let no enmity exist between you, for you are all brothers and sisters in my name. Wherever you are this day, gather your bread and your cup. 
For these are the gifts that we place upon God's table. And no matter where we are today, God is here with us. May we pray. God, take our gifts of bread and wine. Pour out Your Holy Spirit upon them. That they might become for us once again the body and the blood of Christ. His grace, His love, and His Spirit. That we who eat and drink this day may sit at Your table, may share in Your love, and share that love with all whom we sit with today. Make us one with you, one with Christ, and one with each other. Until all the anger and all the bitterness and all the divisiveness is overcome. As we look through Christ's eyes on a broken and fallen world that is desperately in need of redemption and healing. It begins with us as we fill our hearts with the bread of heaven, the cup of love. Amen. Take a piece of the bread and either dip it or drink from the cup. This is the body and the blood of Christ broken for each and every one of us so that we might have life and, they, and that we might know how to live in love. Amen. Go in peace And may the good Lord bless And keep you May the good Lord bless And keep you Till we meet Till we meet